Good evening, this is N7GES, and welcome to the NCARC TechNet. We meet, meet each Monday evening it's <clears throat> at this time uh, on the uh, this frequency, 447-275. Uh, 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 you can also hear us on uh, 447-75 on Echo Link at NCARC. I'm sorry, at W0UPS-R. Um, and we are uh, streaming to YouTube, and uh, you can probably also make comments there as well. We do welcome your input and comments uh, and questions. Um, I'll tell you again that you can reach us by email, uh, <clears throat> by emailing to elmers at ncarc.net. E Elmers, E-L-M-E-R-S, at N-C-A-R-C dot net. Uh, this evening we have a topic um, <clears throat> entitled Backcountry Radio Equipment, Bad Weather Antennas, Mountain Emergency Stations. Uh, what if you are hiking uh, tonight, today, in a lovely, uh, lovely day, and you're hiking in the mountains? How would you tune in the NCARC TechNet? Or uh, if you're in the bottom of a ravine uh, and needing help, how would you? Uh, what kind of an antenna could you use to uh, get uh, communications going again? Let me. Uh, Start by taking a few check-ins, and I also know we have an announcement coming up. There's Kilo Delta Zero, Tango Yankee Uniform, Joe and Loveland. This is K1DEG, Kilo One Delta Echo Golf in Platteville. Okay, welcome to KC0SUN, K1DEG, and KD0TYU. Uh, thanks for being here. Others, please. N0EMP, Greg in Fort Collins, with K0DBE, Debbie. Hello. Kevin in the net, this is Whiskey Zero, Delta Delta Zulu, Dave in Greeley. Okay, welcome to W0LEV and 0NYY, W0DDZ, K0DBE, and N0EMP. <clears throat> Anybody else this evening? This is Kilo Echo Zero, Lima, Charlie, Kilo, KE0LCK, the other mic from Windsor. K-E-0-L-C-K. 
welcome and thank you for being there. All right, uh, those who haven't yet checked in are still welcome to do so anytime. Uh, we'll um, uh, take a break though, and uh, um, as it, but during the discussion of the of the net, please feel free to uh, check in, make comments, and ask questions as you wish. Uh, let's continue though with uh, uh, the announcement from W Zero L E V. Yeah, I'll read. This is a little long, but forgive me. W Zero L E V here, Lima Echo Victor. Uh, probably many of you have heard of citizen science. It's where us citizens who don't have to write grants and get approvals and funding get to do real science. There's a sweet opportunity coming up if you're interested in science. Uh, amateur radio is an integral part of this. Little Thompson Observatory, Bertha, Colorado, is hosting an event for amateur radio operators interested in participating in citizen science projects. Uh, Terry and I have several. This is not part of the write-up. Terry and I have several in mind. The event introduces HAMSCI, a collaboration between professional scientists and amateur radio operators to study topics related to radio propagation using data collected by HAMS. Uh, HAMSCI was featured in QST about four or five months ago. The invited speaker is Dr. Nathaniel Fursell, W2NAF, a space environmental scientist from New Jersey Institute of Technology and lead HAMSCI organizer who will explain HAMSCI and present amateur radio data and scientific results from the 2017 Great American Solar Eclipse. Dr. Terry Bullitt, who we know as W0ASP, will present some HF propagation data from the eclipse. Two projects will be discussed, propagating HF signals to an orbiting HF receiver, and NASA's actually talked about orbiting several SDRs. Let me reset. And monitoring VHF television transmissions for measuring sporadic E and band openings on 10 and 6 meters. This is well beyond the, uh, bu uh, the uh, mm -hmm, yeah, um, bulletin, come on beacon network that operates on both 10 and 6. The event will also feature a tour of the Little Thompson Observatory optical and, yay, radio, radio telescopes, keynote talk, a discussion of possible new projects and weather permitting optical observing after dark. And we've got a wonderful 18 and 24 inch scope you can look through, they're awesome. All amateur radio operators and any persons interested in radio science are welcome. The date, Monday. Mark this on your calendar if interested, July 16th from 1800 to 2200, and many times if the sky is clear, it goes well beyond 2200. Little Thompson Observatory is located on the campus of Bertha High School at 850 Spartan Avenue, Bertha, Colorado. It's easy to get to off I-25 or 287. For further instructions, oh, questions, excuse me, contact Terry Bullitt our own W0ASP at tbullet at skybeam.com. The HAMSI, and you might want to look at this because they're actual hard science contributions from the ham radio, uh, ham radio community. The usual HTTP colon slash slash HAMSI, that's H-A-M-S-C-I dot org. That's the end, and I hope to see some of you there. It will be a very excellent program. W0LEB. All right. Thank you, Dave. That does sound fast, fantastic. Uh, any questions for Dave at this time? I'll comment, too. I, that is, I think, posted on the NCRC uh, reflector, so information is there. W0LEB. Yeah, very good. Any questions for Dave at this time? Okay, assuming I didn't uh, double with anybody, and I don't believe I did, uh, thank you very much, Dave, for that info, and uh, do please uh, look that up and uh, take advantage of it. Uh, that promises to be 
incredibly fascinating. So uh, very good. Thank you for bringing that to us today. Yeah, Kevin, and thanks NCRC and Kevin uh, TechNet, and I'll also announce it on the Wednesday Net for giving us a platform to announce it. And these can be newbie questions or uh, or otherwise, but uh, let's uh, uh, make sure that uh, we don't have any other questions before we launch into our topic for this evening. Yeah. All right, Backcountry Radio. Um, who'd like to get us started on what we're talking about and what is involved? What are some of the things that uh, that implies or uh, that is needed for that? Well, may I call on someone, uh, EMP, uh, you want to volunteer for me? <laughs> hey, Kevin, um, I've been running back and forth between computers here. You said the topic is back country radio? Yeah. Um, Backcountry radio equipment, bad weather <clears throat> antennas, mountain emergency stations, etc. Well, depending on line of sight uh, from my property, which is at 7,500 feet, I can peg uh, K0OJ's two meter station in Greeley with an HT with five watts. So the requirements can be pretty modest. On the other hand, if you're down in a valley, uh, you're gonna need probably HF NVIS unless there's a line to a repeater. Uh, so then you're gonna need uh, some kind of wire antenna, probably a low dipole, and probably at least 20 watts to even hope to be getting reliable voice communication on sideband. S-U-N. S-U-N, go ahead. So as far as equipment goes and uh, doing the backcountry thing, um, there's always, depending on how far you're going away from vehicles, um, if you have the opportunity to set up um, a mobile radio as a uh, uh, crossband repeat that can help you out getting over a hill um, but if it's an unplanned issue where you're stuck at the bottom that's when you're going to need more power uh, the other thing is uh, depending on if you're if you're going really back country and you're going to be out there a while um, you were talking about equipment so 12 volt or whatever volt uh, for charging your radio um, a solar cell can be useful uh, and sometimes can fold up and be lighter than batteries um, otherwise, you know, their batteries and the such uh, are very helpful. But um, uh, definitely, um, if you if you can do cross band repeat and park your vehicle somewhere, that can get you out of that can get you over a lot of stuff. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, EMP, I know that uh, you had a situation where you were stranded and uh, had to do a fair amount of hiking to uh, get out uh, and communicate. Uh, if you had, uh, uh, you know, choices of, uh, of things, uh, was there anything else that you might have added uh, that would have helped you in that situation, perhaps? Uh, you might just let us know what you had. I think you had a mobile and HTs available, uh, what kind of antenna, and that sort of thing. And if you had uh, uh, changes, uh, was, was there, would there be anything that you maybe could have added that would have helped you in that situation? Well, what I did add was a come-along, 
And if I'd have had that, I wouldn't have needed a radio. So there's uh, several extraction items. Uh, it started off as a, uh, a leisurely road trip that became progressively more adventurous um, after we left. So it was unplanned, and we finally ended up getting stuck and unequipped or ill-equipped. So <clears throat> the, uh, I have the bucket of hope now, because if I get stuck, I hope that something in there will get me unstuck. Um, and we always take that when we go out. But no, we just had two HTs. Uh, we had Yesu FT60s. That was it. No spare batteries, no chargers, no nothing. And uh, my wife's also a ham. I had to walk or hike up 30 minutes to the top of a hill. We were up near Black, behind the northwest of Black Mountain, which is up by uh, north, northwest of Red Feather Lakes. So I had to hike up. Uh, 30 minutes to hit this repeater um, and get help coming and because my wife's a ham and she had an HT she stayed down by the vehicle and I was able to simplex down to her and then repeat her out to you guys and zero EMP okay we'll get zero LED LAV go. Yeah, a comment. If you travel on a four wheel drive and you use the four wheel drive to get away from the flak, and this is from experience, uh, don't necessarily go with the biggest antenna you can find and the best performance. Uh, to be able to get out is more important than to get out with uh, full quieting and then some. In the years we lived in the mountains, I went through four commercially available uh, antennas from Diamond and Comet. They just physically do not hold up. In hindsight, the new Jeep, I am installing a very simple MFJ antenna that will take about anything. Uh, no high mass, high loading coils or anything like that. Uh, just. Um, consider or trade off antenna performance versus the longevity of the antenna if you really do the backcountry. And this is from experience. Those darn antennas are 100 plus bucks a piece. I went through four of them. Need I say more? <laughs> it got expensive. I just did a simple homebrew antenna that never broke. W0LEV. inside a piece of one inch PVC that I used as a walking stick. Worked wonderfully uh, backpacking. W0LEV. I want to uh, ask a question 
um, of uh, any of you. Uh, uh, first of all, Dave, uh, I like the idea of expendable antennas. Um, and I would imagine that one of the other things you probably would do is carry an extra in the car so you could uh, replace it, uh, or at least on the NMO mount, I assume you use, uh, so with another one. Uh, but what about, um, <clears throat> um, would, you, would you take a different antenna for different pr propagation, different patterns? of uh, uh, of radiation for different situations. Uh, I've often heard it said uh, five eighths uh, versus half wave uh, with different um, <clears throat> takeoff angles uh, for for different areas. Um, it would uh, is that something that uh, is uh, worth considering. Yeah, you mentioned uh, five eights, and realize that to 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 understand that the five eighths wave radiator does not perform any better than a quarter wave unless you're on almost an infinite ground plane. And yes, Mark, the top of a suburban qualifies <laughs> at least front and back if it's mounted in the middle. Uh, five eighths is not a, a an end all. Uh, what I eventually ended up with was an end fed half wave that puts the high current radiating portion a half wave above the feet point. You can look at it as a J pole quarter wave decoupling stub at the base, and that thing worked better than any commercial antenna I ever had, a hundred bucks and over, and it survived four wheeling in the forests. The commercial antennas did not. W zero L E V. Okay, very good. <clears throat> uh, thank you. Okay, N zero W I Q. Well, one thing is if you build your own antenna, you have to take into consideration what you're going to use it for. And you have to have a certain amount of mechanical experience to build it heavy enough to survive what you're going to use it for. And I think that was the main thing that Dave did was he built his own antenna and it never broke because he had it built heavy enough mechanically that it didn't break and that's my comment back to you back to net in zero wiq okay uh very good uh other comments get out of that hole, even with an HT, um, enough that you could probably, within a couple of, uh, you could probably find a couple of satellites listening to the frequencies if you've got them with you, and you can get to pretty much anywhere and get your, get it at least out that you're stuck. Um, obviously, that would be for emergency use, but uh, with the directional antenna, you can get, doesn't matter how tall the, you know, the mountains are around you, if you can get something over top of you.
Okay. This is N7GES, and this is the NCARC TechNet. Uh, I was talking about that with Mark this morning, and I was going to just ask. Uh, I didn't at that time, uh, but uh, maybe we can talk about that just now. Uh, what what would the time involved be uh, before a person might have a satellite go over that you might at least try for? And of course, this also assumes that you've had experience doing it and you know how to um, how to tune those in, um, and uh, also still that you've got uh, the right amount of equipment, that you the right equipment, the right amount of power, and that you're uh, um, able to get in past all of the other folks that are probably trying for the satellite. At least I would assume that these are all valid concerns. Can somebody that's actually done uh, this kind of satellite uh, um, communications talk to these points just a little bit? Uh, how, how likely is this that a person can use this for that kind of a purpose? I have not used satellites for emergency comm, but I think using any of our amateur satellites for emergency comm is kind of a pipe dream. Leos come over about every 90 minutes. They spend roughly nine minutes horizon to horizon if it's a overhead pass. Uh, I think using the satellites for emergency comm is a bit of a stretch, W0LEV. concern, but it's at least another tool that you might have. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're talking tools, uh, but certainly we're, we're wanting to consider things that are, <clears throat> that are definitely going to work uh, better, uh, you know, more dependably if you've really got to get, uh, get out there. So, uh, and some of these things may not necessarily always be emergencies either but some place where you really want to have communications available. And uh, uh, again, uh, using a satellite for your main communications is, uh, uh, might be a bit on the chancy side, but certainly uh, uh, might be you know, uh, something to try. Uh, just, just remembering that uh, uh, it might be a bit chancy. Uh, if anybody would like to, uh, um, you know, say more about that, I'm certainly open to that, and uh, it's interesting to uh, um, to uh, 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 not really debate, but but talk about those points. Uh, obviously, it requires a fair amount of skill to do uh, make those kind of uh, contacts as well. M zero EMP. EMP go. Yeah, the last couple of exchanges bring up a really good point. Uh, if you plan on being equipped for any kind of emergency communication uh, where someone's health or safety could count on it, um, it's important to test your uh, equipment ahead of time test your technique, whether it's satellite or um, Envis or something else, make sure it works, make sure you're familiar with it ahead of time, and I'd suggest practicing with it at least once a year, if not a couple times a year, to stay, uh, stay up with it, make sure everything's working right. Um, back to the satellite thing with uh, emergency, there's a non-ham solution called Spot, and a Spot device, you buy a, a battery-operated small lightweight device, and it's an emergency beacon, and it transmits a serial number. So you 
when you buy it, it's registered to you with your contact information and home address and stuff and uh, next of kin contact and all that. And if you have to activate it, there are satellites that will pick it up and direction find it very accurately and get search and rescue on the way. And they'll know it's you from the uh, serial number that it transmits and zero EMP. You know, that brings up a whole other uh, mode of communication, possibly that could be quite useful in a situation, um, which is uh, APRS. I don't know sure that the, um, you know, the messaging and tracking that APRS does uh, could, if a creative thinker could figure out a way to make it useful in a, in a survival situation, I'm sure there's lots of ways it could be used. I just got back from the interior of Alaska, took my HT up there. We're probably about 100 miles away from uh, any uh, repeater group. You know, did the research on the Alaska groups, couldn't get any hits, couldn't get any response from the repeater. We were running a sat phone that uh, we had just in case for emergencies. Wanted to really do what... Uh, build like a, uh, you know, a handheld directional to be able to hit a satellite through the app called Heavens Above, which gives you all the paths. Was unsuccessful. Okay. Well, uh, good report to have, um, and uh, a good try certainly there. Uh, you did not try any HF equipment at that point, right? You didn't probably have anything available? Affirmative. I only have a technician license, so I was kind of interested to see what I could do with FM. You know, if there's a pretty strong repeater network, but it's not, there's maybe three repeaters in about a 300 mile radius. Yep, Let okay. Me present another aspect of uh, this is double zero. Um, yeah, and uh, getting back to APRS, uh, obviously uh, with APRS uh, you still got to have either radio contact or internet contact uh, in order to utilize it. So uh, some of the same things are going to apply uh, in those situations. But yes, uh, as far as being located, um, uh, uh, it certainly could be very useful, providing you uh, actually have been able to connect into the into the system. Okay, Kevin. Let me offer another aspect or another facet of this. Please do. Those at home, in the warmth of their shack, if you will, play an important part, too. Remember one trip Pat and I took to Canyonlands, we ran into some really nasty snow, decided to turn around at Monticello, Utah, and come back. I was just thankful to the nth degree that there was someone in Santa Fe on the uh, E2 repeater to carry us through that trip to the uh, to Santa Fe. It was a long trip. When I stopped, all I could see was snowflakes coming at my eyes. But I'm thankful there was someone there on the other end in a warm room to kind of sort of radio-wise escort us through a very nasty snowstorm. W0LEV, there are two sides to this. You betcha. Communication uh, uh, is not going to do any good if you uh, aren't uh, sure you'll have somebody on the other end. 
and uh, that either may re require uh, pre previous arrangements or uh, certainly using a, a, a uh, communication mode where you're certain to have somebody there. And in that situation, uh, uh, neither <clears throat> neither one was uh, uh, necessarily possible, but uh, uh, Santa Fe uh, a repeater worked and uh, and you did have somebody at the at the right time. I've talked several people in uh, on a situation like that, and they may not have even needed somebody necessarily at the time, but they knew they might need somebody, and somebody and and I was able to be there, and others I've seen this happen as well, just to make sure that they had somebody uh, they could t uh, call if uh, something happened. So yes. The second side of that is a uh, very important consideration as well. Uh, other aspects, other equipment. Uh, we, we mentioned bad weather here a minute ago. Um, bad weather antennas. We know we're going to have problems with uh, snow or rain-filled skies and, uh, and things like that. Um, we also have problems with distance getting into repeaters. Uh, what uh, what sorts of things uh, might people recommend uh, for those kind of situations? Um, we 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 have uh, areas where uh, repeaters aren't going to serve. We have uh, uh, additional complications like this. Uh, some other ideas anybody might uh, propose. Yes, you win. Um, two points. First, uh, to um, LEVs, uh, kind of tack on to what he was saying uh, about someone being on the other end. Um, the other, this isn't a piece of equipment, this is more a preparatory thing, which is, you know, file your flight plan. Um, if you're going somewhere uh, and you're leaving civilization, uh, make sure somebody in civilization knows where you are, has an expectation of when you're going to be contacted, um, kind of like a dead man switch, uh, so that if, if something goes wrong and you can't get out, you can't, be, you can't contact, and they know that you left prepared to do so, um, there's at least, I'm not saying they're going to like send somebody out for you right away, but uh, they would at least be able to say, okay, it's been a day since I was supposed to be contacted, or since this person was supposed to be at this waypoint. Um, where they could contact me, something's, you know, something's not correct. So filing your flight plan um, is, is very important, uh, just to make sure you have, even if they're not a ham, you have somebody that's going to, uh, um, going to know where, where you're going to be and what you're supposed to be doing and when you're supposed to be back. Uh, as far as the equipment goes for uh, weather, um, I would say one of the most important things that I've, whether it's camping or backpacking, uh, a piece of equipment that I'm always so happy that I have a couple of extra of when the weather turns bad is trash bags. Just plastic trash bags. Um, they can be used in so many different ways, but the, they're waterproof, and you can uh, you can do a lot with them. And just they're very lightweight, and they'll save your butt more times than you can imagine. I'm going to grab it here. Amen, Alec. Our first two years in Albuquerque, Pat and I hiked up Sandia Crest. <clears throat> we caught in a proverbial uh, sleet, hail, rainstorm on the way down. Frankly, the big uh, black garbage bags saved our butt from going into hypothermia. Good point, W0LEV. Very good. Making time to write notes here. I do uh, t <clears throat> tend to always try to keep notes on what people are saying. Uh, that uh, um, helps me be able to refer back sometimes to what uh, what was said and uh, try to pose uh, further questions and, and stuff like that. So, good points. 
uh, some non-radio, but still <laughs> very important. And there's lots and lots and lots of things we could uh, discuss uh, non-radio-wise that would be incredibly good things to have uh, on our on our uh, take-along list, certainly. Uh, so, and so uh, very good points. Uh, okay, any other um, <clears throat> radio-oriented or uh, um, antenna-oriented or other uh, things that people would suggest? And, and the uh, flight plan, whoa, very good, very good point as well. Um, I think uh, that uh, could be an incredible uh, help in a situation uh, like you've mentioned. Uh, other... Um, other radio equipment uh, or antenna type equipment one might want uh, if they're in an area that's uh, separated a lot uh, quite far from uh, other people, uh, including uh, even on a permanent basis, uh, you know, if you live in an area like that or, or if you're in, an, in a temporary camping area and you're uh, stranded there with bad weather, Maybe not sitting out in the car, but you're you're sheltered in place. You're, everything is fine there, but you want you still might want uh, communications. Any of those situations? Uh, anything additional? Anybody might like to uh, to add to uh, what we can do to keep the c communications going. WIQ. WIQ, go. It would do to have a, at least a general class license so you could use a radio with a wider spread of wavelengths too. Like my IC7100 that I just bought, which goes from 200 meters to 70 centimeters on two antenna spigots, might be handy because it gives you more flexibility from trying to make a communication. Oh, good point. That leads into my next week's topic, which we'll talk about in a little while here. Other uh, other points. N zero EMP. EMP go. So, in an actual life or death emergency, we can transmit on any frequency in any mode legally. Um, some people modify their equipment so it'll operate out of band. Uh, there are two AM frequencies that um, aircraft monitor typically on cross-country flights, uh, 121.5 megahertz and 243.0 megahertz, both AM. That's also the frequency of the emergency locator transmitters. Um, and if someone were in an extremely remote area, like the gentleman from Alaska, um, you could just wait till you see contrails. And five watts goes a long way when it's line of sight, straight up or straight down. A uh, typical uh, aircraft radio, I think, is only 35 watts, but um, and it goes 100 miles when it's at altitude with no trouble. So that's an option. N zero EMP. So the only other equipment that I was uh, thinking about, and you just um, you just reminded me of it, was uh, to make sure. I know it sounds silly, but uh, you never know what you're going to need to do, or when you're going to need to do it, or how you're going to need to do it, or what the position might be. So you might have a radio that you, you know, your your HT even, um, but and you know how to you know to do what it needs to do. But you should bring the uh, you should bring the manual or have a manual with you because there's lots of other things your radio can do, like scanning or whatever that may, depending on the situation, help you. Um, I actually just the other day figured out how to get my cheap, you know, my cheap little UV5R to scan. And I was able to pick up um, 
frequencies with this that were um, out of the handbands that people were using. So if in an emergency situation, I can transmit on those frequencies too. So that, it, it, that would have been useful in an emergency because I could find other, um, other bands that people are uh, transmitting on. So having the manual to your radio is, is, uh, is important if you're going to be out somewhere where you, you might need to use all of its features to get, where, get out to where you need to get to. EMP. Uh, yeah. Um, SUN, just, just remember to send your, to uh, transmit your, your uh, suffix uh, so I can recognize you first in case uh, uh, we had a double or something. EMP, go ahead. Yeah, what SUN just said reminded me of another good point. Um, most of our radios can at least receive uh, outside the ham bands and situational awareness can be important. When I hike up in uh, on, long, on the Longs Peak trails up there, I use my uh, FT60 to listen to 171 point, I think it's 75. It's the uh, Twin Sisters repeater for Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, and just listening there, I know what's going on on the trails. So if there's a situation, I don't blindly stumble into it. Um, or if someone's lost, you know, you get a lost uh, kid or something and there's a description put out, you know, you might spot them. So um, just receiving um, traffic that's pertinent to the area that you're in can be useful too and in improve your safety and other people's safety and zero EMP. Very good. Do we have any new uh, people that have checked in or that would like to check in and make additional comments here? KB0SCX, George and Bertha. Good evening, George. Glad to have you with us. Did you have any comments you want to make here at this point, George? I did have one question, and that is, what is a NVIS antenna look like that's mounted on a vehicle? Um, and if you're going to use NVIS to communicate uh, with somebody, you have to have somebody... Uh, prepared to receive your calls. Well, I could uh, probably say yes, you'll, you'll need to have somebody uh, listening for you, or you should, although you may be able to find uh, uh, other frequencies where people would be, where you would hear people. Uh, so you're not necessarily locked out <clears throat> because you have an Envis uh, antenna. Uh, we're talking um, probably like four or five hundred miles, I believe. Uh, somebody can set me straight, as opposed to you know thousands of miles across the ocean. Uh, so uh, uh, y you know you can get you know next door or uh, a bit further. Uh, with the Envis antenna. Uh, as far as a mobile antenna, uh, somebody might uh, chat with us about that a little bit and what, uh, what are the possibilities. Generally, we're talking about a, um, a wire of some sort that's up maybe uh, anywhere from 15 feet to, to, to lower than that. Uh, but uh, uh, anybody that would uh, ch chat with us a bit more about what uh, what we might look at as a portable situation. EMP. Uh, go ahead, please. So NVIS is near vertical incident sky wave, meaning you're putting as much of your energy as you can 
pretty much straight up, and it's bouncing down into a cone that's, yeah, about 200 miles radius, so about a 400-mile diameter circle. Um, this is always going to be below um, probably 10 megahertz. There's a thing called critical frequency, and if you look at um, the ionograms that uh, Terry makes, or that you can get out of Boulder's ionogram uh, radar. Um, shooting straight up, there's a frequency above which it just keeps going and doesn't come back down. So even if you have good 10 or 20 meter propagation at a low angle to the horizon, shooting straight up, it's going to go right through. So typically, we're talking 80 meters at night. 40 meters in the daytime, and 60 meters, some of both. So those three bands is really all you're going to talk about, 80, 60, and 40. You want a horizontal antenna? It can be up high. If you happen to have a, a high dipole, it'll still work. Um, it doesn't have to be low to the ground, but the idea is in an emergency, you can string it six feet off the ground, and it'll work, and you'll get out. And if you want to practice with it, uh, practice on the high noon net. I think that's 40 meters. And just string a low dipole out and see how well you can contact them. Or the uh, Wyoming cowboy net is another good one to practice on and see what it does. Uh, mobile, um, it's going to be hard to get a good horizontal mobile antenna on HF. You're probably going to have to park somewhere and string a wire out and zero EMP. Yeah, I should comment there, Greg, <clears throat> of recent, and as long as we're in the solar cycle slump, the F0F2 has been below 7 megahertz. So it's best to stick with our 5 megahertz or 75, 80 meter allocations until solar conditions pick up. W0LEV, and it's all on the boulder ionogram. backpacking and say I'm just taking like a UHF VHF HT with me um, you know whip antenna and I can uh, you know get out to my friends and, and talk to the other people in the group and whatever is there any and I don't know if, if it is if there is one but is there any antenna type that you know collapsible or a wire that I can set up uh, for um, UHF and VHF that would allow for any different um, types of propagation uh, I, directional propagation, I know I can do a directional antenna, but I was just thinking any other any other options other than just direct or directional. I know and the vertical at 5 watts is just going to go straight up and, and dissipate into the ionosphere, so it's not going to really bounce or it's going to go through it. Um, but are there any other antenna options in that situation? EMP. EMP go. Yeah, N9TAX, November 9, Tango Alpha X-ray. He makes a real nice roll-up J-Pole style antenna uh, for HTs. It's dual band, uh, 2 meter and 70 centimeter. It's about 5 feet long. You hang it up in a tree and it's got lightweight coax that goes to the radio. Um, it gets out a lot better than a whip. It's still going to be a conventional mode of propagation. You're not going to get some kind of magic, you know, ionospheric scatter or anything like that, but it does get out a lot better than any whip you're going to get. considering a, um, a Moxon antenna, um, and Dave may be able to comment on that, but we've been getting uh, pretty good results uh, simplex, uh, at least around here. Uh, 
uh, with them. Um, don't know. Uh, they are directional, but not not extremely directional, and that was, I guess, one of the reasons I thought of it. Uh, first WIQ, and then we'll send it back uh, with uh, with my question. Okay, Kevin. Well, in zero, uh, I can't remember his whole call. Bart, NYY, there it is. In zero, NYY uses a Inbus antenna, so he has experience with them. But you're talking about being able to reflect the signal off the ionosphere, so the angle at which you set the intercept the ionosphere is the complementary angle that it comes down for a distance. So, hey, that's just a little tidbit about Inbus. NPU. Uh, NZU, good evening. Uh, KD0 NTU. At this past field day, I had a uh, 20 meter NVIS set up up behind uh, the operations area, and it covered pretty well. Although we didn't get Alaska or Florida, but uh, Hawaii to Maine, Florida, Montana seemed to come in real well, and some of the people using the, the radio at the trailer there uh, made contacts, Florida and all across uh, Conus. Okay, excellent. Can you give me your whole call once more, please? This is KD0, NPU, Kilo Delta, Zero, November, Papa Uniform. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, Envis and Census are great things, and they work well. Um, so, uh, excellent there. Uh, let me see. Did we miss anybody there? Uh... Any questions? Um, oh, Dave, just asking you, uh, what about the Moxon antennas? Do you, you, you have not had uh, any experience with them, I think you told me, uh, but uh, just knowing about their propagation, uh, any idea about takeoff angle and stuff, uh, whether they would be uh, uh, reasonable for, uh, you know, a higher... Uh, areas to get back down into uh, VHF or UHF. We are going to act basically like a two element Yagi. Treat them the same. Double gear zero LEV. Okay. Very good. Thank you. All right. Other questions or comments, please. Well, did we uh, answer most of the questions that uh, uh, we posed at the beginning of the net? Um, um, how you would get uh, communications in a uh, in a remote area in an emergency type situation, or uh, maybe non-emergency, but just uh, uh, for uh, uh, information or uh, welfare uh, reports or. Uh, um, supplies needed, um, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, are there any other um, ways uh, we could get communications through if we're uh, quite a ways out of range of repeaters? Um, is, uh, is VHF uh, going to be uh, pretty much uh, out of uh, uh, usability at a, at a certain distance, and we're really going to have to rely on HF at certain points just to get uh, just to get our, our message through. 
Uh, S U N here. I was just going to say that um, uh, one thing, that, and I, I'm guilty of this. I probably should be better at it. But uh, there may be a situation where you can get something. You can tell somebody's on the other side. Maybe they can get to you, uh, but you don't have enough power to get out to them, and, and they're getting a very um, weak, scratchy signal, you know, completely un, un, unable to understand you. It's a situation where um, knowing code could come in handy, uh, even if you were only able to do uh, code on via uh, actual carrier, uh, on and off carrier, um, you could you could uh, get information across if you knew code. Good point. Even with VHF, UHF, and an HT, you will have to be a little careful with an HT uh, or or any any radio uh, if it may have a delay in in its uh, release um, or its uh, uh, transmit. But uh, that is something that could be worked with, perhaps. So you know, it's a good point. Yeah, as long as you found, got somebody that, uh, as long as you know the code and you've got somebody on the other end that knows the code. So, uh, yeah, uh, uh, another, another, um, another reason why you might want to consider learning it at some point. Uh, other points, please? Are there other comments? Anybody that hasn't commented yet that would like to make a comment? K7 AVV. Hi there, Randy. Please go. Yeah, we've done some testing, at least within Larimer County, up at uh, places like uh, Long Draw Reservoir and places like that. Uh, most people consider that to be out of the range of uh, repeaters, but we have worked with a single digit repeater on top of the White Mountains and uh, able to get through on packet as well as being able to get through on voice from up there with something as simple as a five element Yagi on two meters. So that's not out of the question, but we also collaterally checked 40 meters and 40 meters was working from up there. So um, generally speaking, uh, wire antennas were, was, was all that was used on HF and those were at, at endless heights. So um, depends on how far you wanna go and uh, who need to talk to there? K7 ABV. I know I mentioned it before. This is KC0 SUN. Uh, but that also, again, uh, reminds me that if you have the opportunity and the equipment and, the, and you have, if you're going out in the woods and you happen to have the opportunity to set up a mobile base station um, while you go portable, um, setting up cross-band repeat, putting your vehicle in, a, in an area where it can get out to a repeater or something, um, if, if an emergency arises, even if you're just out there alone, uh, which you shouldn't be, but or your, your group is out there, you can set your vehicle to get out to a repeater, and then you only need to use your radio on that frequency in an emergency situation. So being prepared and knowing how to set your radio up for something like that is very useful. Yeah, now one thing uh, I would caution on the uh, crossband repeat is that uh, uh, remember um, that your radio will be transmitting all of the time anybody is on the repeater as well as when you transmit. So you may not be using the radio much, but if you're listening uh, and the repeater is talking, your crossband radio is transmitting. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of radios made for crossband but not necessarily are they all made to transmit on high power continuously. So uh, uh, at times you'll have to be careful not to 
not to uh, want to drive, not to want to put the radio on high power if it's going to transmit a lot. And of course, that's uh, also dependent not only on your usage, but on other people's usage of the repeater. Uh, you could also use that crossband for simplex frequencies as well. And there you might have a little less trouble and you could use a higher power without worrying that the radio is going to be uh, used too much and perhaps get too hot. We have had trouble with that in the past with the uh, uh, TYT, um, <clears throat> what is it, 8900s. Uh, so many people have that uh, are, are really good radios, but uh, just can't necessarily handle running on high power nearly continuously. So that's another caution uh, that I'll just put out there for anybody that's uh, considering using crossband repeat. Other comments from anybody? Whiskey Bravo Zero Uniform Whiskey Echo. Go ahead. Okay, back in the day, we're talking early 1970s here, even two meter end, uh, repeaters were scarce as hen's teeth. So when you were mobiling across country, you usually had nets like east cars, mid cars, west cars that you tuned into so if anybody needed to get a hold of you, they could, and vice versa. Uh, it was a common, shall we say, meeting ground um, <laughs> just, to, just to get people together. Um, and uh, so my hint nowadays is, I think they're actually still in the air, but I'm not sure what they are. Uh, but there are various nets that we know meets at various times of the day. And so, uh, don't rule out HF for uh, back country. Uh, you don't even have to go really that much back country. All you have to do is go across the divide. There's almost no amateurs over there, <laughs> and essentially no repeaters. <laughs> so anyway, that's my hint for the evening, WB0 UWE. Okay, Steve. I just want to clarify what you were mentioning. Uh, were these HF frequencies you were talking about? Uh, these were not repeaters, correct? Uh, the mid-car series was all on 40 meters, and uh, they were all within 10 kC of each other. Uh, they were separated by 5 kC. I think mid I think mid cars was the middle frequency. East cars was on one side, west cars was on the other side by 5 kc, and uh, which made them real easy to tune back and forth on a short mobile whip, uh, which worked out very very nicely. And uh, if you know your nets, uh, like the high noon net of very and Columbine and. Some of the others that are still on the air, the Marine Mobile Net, if you really get desperate, um, and yes, they will work land, land side, uh, but basically the, uh, when I'm on the west slope, yeah, I will have the two meters on and call about every 10, 15 minutes on 5-2 just to see if there's actually somebody there, but of course the odds are pretty slim. But once in a while, you'll find somebody that's actually traveling the same direction you are, so at least you've got somebody to talk to. <laughs> WP0, UWE. Okay. Well, very interesting. I had not heard of those before, and uh, that's fascinating. <laughs> and uh, how neat and convenient, it, I'm sure. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, not sure about those either, but there are plenty of nets that are that are on HF uh, that you could find uh, probably and uh, and get uh, some uh, information or a message or get some help as well. Steve, it's good to hear you on the uh, on the uh, 
net again. It's been a while. I know you've been uh, recovering, and I know prior to that you didn't have uh, equipment working on this frequency, so I'm glad you're back. Any other comments from anybody? Uh, this is N7, GES, I should say, uh, and this is the uh, TechNet. We're talking backcountry radio, emergency uh, uh, transmission, transmitter uh, stations, and uh, bad weather antennas. Well, I'm imagining that uh, we have not yet totally covered the situation, but uh, I'm sure that uh, there are many other things that a person could cover, but at least we've uh, given some uh, basics, uh, we've gotten started with some basics to consider. Um, next week, I'd like to discuss the various license classes and why should you upgrade? Um, this could, this could, uh, um, it, we've made some points tonight that might, uh, answer some of that, uh, but I'm sure there are other, uh, points at least, uh, as well to cover there. So some of this will be basic knowledge, uh, for those of you who are new, uh, that might be helpful, uh, and, uh, and hopefully we'll bring up some points to, uh, Discuss why why you might want to uh, progress a little further in the in the hobby uh, through the various license exams. So uh, we'll uh, look at those points next week. And uh, anybody that wants to uh, do some research or think about some things can uh, have the time to do that. I do apologize that I got this topic up late, uh, but hey, uh, thank you for uh, bearing with me anyway. And uh, uh, I appreciate everybody's uh, input on this as well. Once again, I will uh, remind you that if you have questions about the net, questions for the net, or topic suggestions, please email us at elmers, E-L-M-E-R-S, at N. C-A-R-C, as in Northern Colorado Amateur Radio Club, dot net. And uh, that'll be the easiest way to get uh, those to me, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll certainly do what we can with them. The YouTube uh, page. Uh, Dave, remind me, it's just N-C-A-R-C. Yeah, that's correct, Kevin. It's youtube.com slash N-C-A-R-C. And we do have a, uh, a non-official uh, Facebook page for N-C-A-R-C, uh, so you can look that up as well. I don't necessarily follow that all the time. I mean, I... I don't spend a lot of time on Facebook in general, so uh, comments for the TechNet are best emailed to elmers at ncarc.net, but at least uh, that's another area where you can chat and uh, talk to people. Uh, but uh, uh, that's not necessarily a part of, uh, of the TechNet proper or NCARC uh, officially, uh, therefore, um, I would not um, refer there for, you know, problems or questions about the NCARC uh, that maybe need to be answered by officials. But it's there, and it's good uh, stuff as well. So I will close the net at this point. Uh, last, uh, well, last, uh, last time, any other comments or questions? Then thanks to all for your participation, and we'll close the net uh, at this point and uh, return the frequency to normal use, and we'll see you again next week. Thank you, and 73, have a wonderful holiday. N7GES, clear.
This presentation was brought to you by the Northern Colorado Amateur Radio Club. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to like and subscribe.